My name is Charles Duan. I am the director of the Patent Reform Project at Public Knowledge, and we've got a great panel. Um, you know, as as the guy who works on patents, you know, I get to see a lot of cool technologies. And the people we've got on this panel, you know, have some of the coolest things that I've seen, you know, in my entire life. So, you know, this is this is going to be really great. Uh, we're going to be talking about 3D printing in the environment. And so, starting from your left, we've got Ryan Hoover, uh, who is an artist and researcher who works at the intersection of digital fabrication, biological systems, and traditional crafts. Um, and then we have Tyler McGanny, um, who is the um, co who is the founder of a company called Philobot, uh, which works on recycling 3D printed materials to make new fil uh, filaments. Um, and then on the other side, we have Allie Kohler. Um, she, um, she, through the lens of biology, material, technology, and computation, seeks to develop a new language of design. She works on a lot of um, biological um, 3D printing materials, which is you know, really cool stuff. And then finally, we have Blake Marshall, who works at the uh, Department of Energy. He manages research and development programs um, that advance the state of the art in additive manufacturing technologies. Uh, so what I wanted to do is I want to start out by you know just going down just going down um, in order and you know if you could each talk a little bit about uh, what you're working on um, in terms of the 3D printing space because it's really interesting stuff. So uh, Ryan, why don't we start with you? So, uh, thanks for having us here. Uh, I'm excited about this panel. Um, so in, I guess my work is, uh, as we mentioned, really looking at the intersections of digital and biological systems. So designing uh, primarily bioprinters. Um, so we're taking, uh, so typically bioprinting, a lot of this is focused on tissue engineering, so things coming from uh, folks trying to 3D print new organs uh, or, or small tissue samples from pharmaceutical tests. So we're taking a lot of those technologies but applying them uh, to other purposes, um, looking at these uh, as, as possible technologies for developing new materials. Um, so there's, which I think is a real need, we've kind of heard a few people touch on this already today. There's only so many little plastic things that you want in your life. Um, so for 3D printing to really, I think, become a meaningful technology, we need to expand our materials. Um, additionally, we also need materials that are better for the environment, um, and plastic's not uh, necessarily so great in that regard. Um, so I think that there's this need for materials. Uh, we also need uh, advances in printers. Um, that are really open, and we need better software as well. I think that, that really can handle the uh, all of the complexities of 3D printing and all of the complexities of uh, biological systems that we're working with, and uh, the complexities of this environment. So, uh, trying to understand all these things together, help these interdisciplinary teams. Awesome, thanks, Ryan. <laughs> this is really a microphone thing, it's gonna be fun. Um, Tyler, you come at this from a, from a somewhat different angle, I guess, from an entrepreneurial angle. So, can you talk a little about the company that you started? Yeah, so uh, my company is called Philobot, and we make a machine that makes the feedstock for 3D printers. Um, 3D printers, or the type of 3D printers we use, use a plastic wire uh, to build up the objects, and our machines will be able to or take uh, failed prints, uh, stuff out of the recycling bin, and then converts it into this feedstock. So we, um, we're creating like a closed loop recycling environment um, and we're also allowing for new polymers to be made with our machines. Um, biologically we had a, uh, a company or a college take a, a Tylenol or an ingestible um, plastic and infuse it with Tylenol and uh, they 3D printed different shapes and tested like the dispersion rates in the human body. So um, our machines are really like expanding the materials and also doing the recycling. Awesome, thanks. Um, and so moving on, so Ali, you've got a fascinating background starting out with architecture, you know, going into kind of the bi biological manufacturing space. Can you talk a little about um, the work that you've been doing? So, um, I mean, I started off as an architect and got a bit disillusioned. Well, I think the same reason that a lot of uh, designers do get disillusioned because we sort of come from this petrochemical um, mm -hmm. sort of in industry, and especially, you know, um, sort of manufacturing is a lot of petrochemicals. And I started doing research in ways of, of design and thinking about new ways that we could, you know, uh, revolutionize design. And I started focusing on something called biofabrication, which is pretty much the next generation of uh, 3D printing or additive manufacturing. It's also the stuff that, that Ryan focuses on. And basically, it has its origins in uh, the biomedical industry, where they're sort of using uh, natural systems and natural so the building blocks of nature, things like proteins, uh, cellulose, collagen, to grow and form through things from, from engineering cells to tissue cultures to start growing products. 
And there's a big move, movement in this new form of additive manufacturing or biofabrication, which is actually thinking of applying that technology to consumer products. Um, and hopefully, from my perspective, one day we'll be able to sort of grow new architectures and new products around us that um, can be sort of recycled back, straight back into the earth again, uh, if that's what we want, or otherwise just sort of really rethink the way in which we design. Awesome, thanks. Oh, thanks, Ellie. Oh, and sorry, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> She's got so much interesting stuff to say. <laughs> no, but I, um, I actually work for one of the companies that are um, really using this to revolutionize product. I uh, work for a company called Modern Meadow that are trying to grow leather in the lab, just so you can see some of the applications where this would be used at. Uh, there's also other companies. Um, I organize a, a conference <coughs> once a year called Biofabricate, which looks at these technologies. Um, and currently, I think within the next year, one of the first companies will start producing uh, engineered spider silk for, to create clothing, as clothing is one of the sort of biggest waste uh, producers in the, you know, uh, globally right now. And they're sort of, so they're engineering spider silk to create fabrics, which is just quite revolutionary. We'll be seeing that on our sort of shelves pretty soon. Awesome, thank you. And finally, we've got Blake, who's at the Department of Energy. Um, you know, I see that you know you've you've used three D printing to make a car, a house, a boat. You know, lots of huge stuff. Uh, so, tell us a little bit about your experience uh, at the Department of Energy, working with three D printing technology. Great. Yeah. And, and first off, just thank you for having me. Uh, this is a subject matter that is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, so, I actually started out in natural sciences and then uh, moved on to life cycle energy modeling, and now. Uh, the Department of Energy, we work on advancing these technologies to the next level. So it's actually a lot of R&D work to bring the next generation of printers on. Um, so the intersection of environment and 3D printing is something that I, I, I think about a lot, and I often get asked that question, you know, how does 3D printing and save energy or questions like that? And the answer is, um, is, is typically, you know, it's, it's somewhat complicated, right? Um, as we've heard from, uh, from Tyler and other panelists here, um, it starts out with that material question, right? If we only have to use energy to transform one particular, you know, the, the areas where you need it, if, uh, where you deposit material, you could potentially use less energy, use less material. Um, you could also substitute materials that are less uh, energy intensive for others um, that are just preferred in plastics and things like that, or recycling aspects. Um, so there are many, uh, on the material side, we have, we have a lot of uh, potential benefits. You also have um, what you can make with 3D printing really opens up um, the, the field to different designs. So you can make things that were really impossible to, to fabricate in other ways. So that's great. So you can have things that are lightweight, uh, topology optimized um, structures, and you can maybe put that on a vehicle, for instance. You can save energy uh, for 10 years, 20 years, as long as that vehicle is driving around your same energy. You can also use it to make clean energy products. So uh, we're currently working. Uh, project right now, we're printing a uh, blade mold for a wind turbine. So we're essentially working on it's a full size, not a full size blade, but it's about 40 feet long, and we're going to be flying in about a year uh, on a wind turbine. And we're flying, we're printing the mold process. So of course, if you can enable that, um, the cheaper or better uh, wind turbines, of course, you can get it that way. Um, so there are many different ways in which they interact. But I guess point B, um, those are things that are potential possibilities, but we're not there. Manufacturers cannot adopt technology unless it's reliable, it's consistent, and it delivers the properties and the components that they need. Um, and many of these partners just aren't there. So uh, a lot of what you can do is just push the advanced state-of-the-art in the printing technology generically, uh, the material sets uh, themselves to get a sort of point, which you know, none of that matters unless it's in a product. Right? None of it matters unless it's out there saving energy uh, on, you know, on, on large, and if we're actually trying to talk about saving energy. Um, yeah, you know, lots of really interesting, really interesting thoughts there, uh, Tyler. I think that um, you you had some some things you wanted to add. Yeah, just real quick on uh, like what 3D printing can do. So there's this uh, there's this bearing with the herringbone gears inside that act as the ball bearings. Um, you can't make it on any other traditional method. Oh, phone's going off. Sorry. And uh, you can't make it with a billion dollar machine. You can only make it with 3D printing. And you could this 3D printer could be scrap parts pulled from. Um, uh, e, you know, an e-waste uh, dump. So it's very interesting. 
Yeah, definitely. So, you know, let's talk a little bit about materials because, you know, I think that's come up a number of times. Because, you know, material, um, you know, material engineering is obviously very important in terms of, you know, environment concerns and also just in terms of the technology. Um, so it seems like, you know, we've got a couple people who are working on kind of novel materials. Tyler, you're obviously working on recycling materials. Um, you know, what are, what are the advances that you see coming, you know, right now or in the future in terms of materials for, uh, for 3D printing? Um, I'll let any of you start with that. <laughs> Anneli, you look like you have something to say about that. I mean, I, I mean the, the materials I work with aren't for traditional 3D printing, you know, it's new ways of added, additive manufacturing, but what's really amazing about um, sort of the, the technology that I'm involved in is that there's no waste. You can pretty much engineer something to uh, grow the material that you want, in the quantities that you want, in the shape and form that you want, with, with zero waste, zero land usage. Um, I know in the company that I work for, um, zero need for cows really. We just need a bit of salt, you know, you need a little bit, a little bit of salt, sort of matter from a cow, you can leave it out of pasture and, you know, a couple of weeks later you have a leather product. So it really is revolutionizing the way in which we think about the supply chain um, and the waste that's, that's a result of it currently. Yeah, I think there's, um, there's a number of interesting um, new materials that are kind of coming out now. There, I think there's, I feel like in the past, um, in the past three or four years, there's been a lot with just kind of FDM printers and, and better plastics and things like that, which is important. Uh, I don't mean to like just plastics too hard uh, right off, right off get here. Um, so, uh, but I think more, to me what's more interesting are these materials that we'll be using for uh, biofabrication. So that, and we can think of materials kind of in two different uh, sets. Um, one is, is typically going to be some kind of matrix uh, into which your, uh, your living thing is growing on or in. Um, so there's, uh, I think, a lot of uh, great work happening around hydrogels for that. Uh, and 3D printing hydrogels, particularly with photopolymers. Um, I think that's, that's a really kind of exciting area of uh, research that I've, I've been working on with uh, another engineer. Um, so I think that's one area. Um, but then I think there's, there's so much uh, to explore in terms of the, the actual biological materials, whether those are uh, plant materials, um, you know, even maybe even some mammalian materials. Uh, there's a lot of complex ethical questions that we need to start asking ourselves. Um, but I think that there's, uh, there's plenty of precedent, and I think we have, um, we, we, have, we have the tools to address those uh, issues successfully if, if we, we get together and do that. Uh, Ryan, I think you touched on a good point in that um, there are, I think the way of viewing it is that there are, uh, the potential to use many different uh, materials is huge, and we can only harness right now a very small chunk of that in terms of making things well. I mean, everyone knows you can put various different plastics, for instance, or an FDM printer, what does everyone use ABS and PLA? Because you know it better, right? You just have, it, it, it's more likely that you'll get a reliable bill of that sort of life. So honestly, I think we're at the tip of the iceberg, and also 3D printing technologies in general are very diverse. So we're talking about it's very small scale um, biomaterials up to, you know, sort of larger sort of started structures that you know, I tend to look at it, it's not work. Um, very wide open. Uh, so but people are looking at, you know, multi-material structures, all kinds of composite materials. We do a lot of work in metal alloy development, higher temperature alloys, um, and working on, you know, addressing the crystallographic texture or something like an economic high temperature uh, uh, nickel alloy. So I mean, in terms of metals, wide open, most of the alloys today are optimized for processing. So it works fine on traditional <coughs> processing, but because the, the what is experienced within the process of pre-printing, it just doesn't work so well when you put it in a pre-printer, right? So the whole world of materials, people see more and more, uh, especially in the tailor creation of the automation space. Yeah. I think also uh, closing that loop is very important. Um, you know, developing the material is kind of like the fun part. Um, it's a lot of work. Uh, but, um, but then qualifying that material um, is, is super important. Like there's like, 
uh, really great work happening at NIST around that. Um, NIST seems like maybe like the most boring organization on the planet, but they're like, stuff they do that's really cool. <laughs> But I love it. It's stellar. Like, the kind of work people are doing there is just really brilliant. And it's super critical. Again, like we were saying before, it, you can have the greatest material in the world, but if you, if you can't put numbers to it, you know, nobody's going to apply it. Um, so having, like, really closing that loop so we can have a material development, uh, qualifications of materials, and then folding them back into the design software. Um, you know, if you're, uh, if you're designing something um, in SolidWorks, you can run, like, a finite element analysis if it's going to be, like, a well-known aluminum alloy, and you can figure out, like, what those strengths are. Um, yeah. You know, if you want to make it out of um, mycelium, nobody knows how to do that, right? And it'll be a while. Um, but you know, having so being able to account for these really diverse materials and across multiple scales. Absolutely. So, so Tyler, you know, I, I'm guessing that you've got some experience with you know trying out different materials that, that work with, uh, with with the machines that you sell. Yeah, I mean. Um, the, the type of technology uh, Philibot is, is based around is, is just the plastic. Um, you can put different binders in. Um, you can put to like a wood filled plastic, um, a metal filled, um, stuff like that. So that's really specific to that type of technology. But I think overall we're seeing a huge growth and um, huge application growth even um, with 3D printing, with the technology, and with uh, with the materials. I mean, a multi-material printer that you could really 3D print a full phone is going to be amazing. And I I honestly, I think we're <laughs> headed that way. Well, so I mean, you know, give me your best estimate. You know, what, what do you think are the things that have to happen um, before, we, before we get there? Well, every, uh, every process of 3D printing is different from bio to FDM to laser to metal. Mm -hmm. uh, being able to combine all that into one machine is really where it's going to be at. Um, and you do have different processes, like the bio is, is mostly, correct me if I'm wrong, you have to build the structure and let it grow into it. But um, like the metal powder printing, you have a hot laser, and that would probably kill anything organic. <laughs> so <laughs> you have to make all that like work together, and I think that's going to be the biggest step, binding it all. Uh, yeah, you know, I think that you know those are those are definitely going to be some really interesting challenges. I'm, I'm guessing, uh, Blake, you've also dealt with some of the, the challenges of you know trying to integrate a lot of these different technologies together in, in large scale manufacturing. Yeah, I think. Um, that's very true. We, uh, again, are trying to be, we're uh, a little less farther out there in terms of, we're trying to get the, the near-term things to market mm -hmm. with yourself. So a lot of the issues we have are just in terms of material performance and reliability. What we find is that simply compositing, like that first level saying, you know, okay, ABS by itself isn't good enough. What happens if we add carbon fiber? I mean, that's where we have to solve our challenge, our challenges, uh, the speaking the person who is that, and, and then that's not trivial, right? We're talking about two very different materials interacting in very complex ways, very different porosity, the chemistry changes, etc. And you can change the quality of fiber out of the fiber. And there are open questions that still take a lot of development in terms of on the ground, but even that first step, I mean, I think, yeah, there's um, various composite materials, and how you three those are. And then, you know, there are ways in which you talk about making two products rather than uh, tell us. You know, vision, I think, is, is great. It's not going to be It's here. a little far out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, in terms of taking two, like, the basic saying, um, we're working on this, but how do you, how do you print electronics into FDM? Because that's an area where you can see something like a drone or a VAP or whatever. Um, it's, we're almost there. We can make the shapes. We can make the forms. Um, there are ways in which you can print electronics. That's being done in a lot of various ways. But getting those two to work together, you know, printing any, you know, electronics don't like to Things don't like to stick to it. It doesn't the ABS or whatever. It, it, there are big ridges, there are gaps, or holes. Things settle into these, these, uh, these spaces and boards between um, prints. And it matters where the printer is going and when it turns a corner and gives an eddy. You know, all these sort of challenges are out there. But I think those are, that may be one of the areas where we see um, sooner than later uh, someone really getting uh, some products to market in that space. Um, I just wanted to respond to that as well. I think one of the key things about the sort of multi material and multi-technology uh, uh, sort of future that we're imagine, imagining, where the, the answer lies is actually creating multi-disciplinary uh, teams to work together. So that's a successful future, is actually getting different people from different backgrounds. I mean, that's why I'm an architect working in 
by fabrication because it's just that sort of creative collision that we need and that's where we're going to find a lot of the magic of the future of 3D printing and additive manufacturing. So it's getting completely people that you never thought would, would work together together in a room and getting them to brainstorm the, the solutions because that's where the magic lies. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that, that that's, you know, it's, it's a really great point that, you know, there's a lot of collaboration that's going on, and, you know, I know Emily and um, um, Ryan, you both, um, you both host conferences um, on, on kind of new developments, and, you know, do you see that sort of interaction between participants going on? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, in, in my, the, the company I work for right now, we have science engineers, we have mechanical engineers, we have physicists, we have you know, us lowly architects, we have like just so many, so much sort of uh, intellectual capacity get together in a room and, and we really create amazing stuff. And the conference we have as well, I mean the, the sort of diversity of people that attend um, is just quite incredible and it's, it's just beautiful to see what they do when you, when you stop putting these people together in a room. Yeah, if you haven't been to Biofabricate, go next year. It's, it's an amazing <laughs> conference. <laughs> no, it, it really is fantastic. Um, well, you've got one too, right? Yeah, so we host a conference called the Bioprinting Breakout, um, which is really uh, geared specifically around uh, bringing in um, just a, a wide range of expertise. So uh, a lot of people coming from the kind of biomedical field, tissue engineering, but then artists, designers, uh, you know, computer scientists, uh, material engineers, again, getting everybody all under one roof. And that's, that's something that's organized um, through a group of us at the Baltimore Underground Science Space. So it's a, it's a hacker space. We talked a lot about the value of hacker spaces. Um, so this, it's a hacker space for biology. Um, so it, it attracts a, a really wide range of people. Um, you know, it's rare to have uh, all these kind of disciplines under one roof. I mean, even in a university, there are multiple buildings. Um, Kind of um, so, so having creating those sorts of spaces is, is really important. Um, so, I think, so that's one one great area, and, and again, these interdisciplinary teams are so so necessary. Um, that's another thing we're trying to do at, at MICA as well, where I, I also teach, is um, really bring bring those things together. There's a, there's a, a lot of examples where artists kind of go into these sort of lab spaces, um, which are great. This artisan residence model, uh, but we also need the inverse. You know, people are always talking about like, oh, the, the arts are great; they they make our sciences and technology better. Um, but like, okay, that's true, but that's not that's not the primary value of arts. Uh, arts are valuable in and of themselves, and and actually bringing in these scientists and engineers and the arts makes makes that better. Too. So we have an, an engineer in residence at Micah. Uh, we have. Um, just about a small bio lab there uh, as well. Um, so really, really uh, having these interdisciplinary teams and having them in, in all sorts of spaces, so like hacker spaces, schools, um, like companies that are really forward thinking, mm -hmm. are all super important. Yeah, you know, lots of lots of really interesting opportunities for kind of collaboration, cross pollination. Work. Um, so you know, we're, we're supposed to be talking about the environment. Um, <laughs> so uh, you know, I, I guess you know, what are, what are the environmental challenges that you see, um, you know, coming up that you think that three D can can start addressing? Um, you know, I think this is something that you can all answer. So why don't we just kind of go down, go down the road? Um, um, let's start. Let's start at the other end. So Blake. Sure. Yeah, we're looking at a lot of different applications. Uh, really wide, the wide uh, net when you're talking about, we don't, we don't only look at the imprinters or things like that, so one example would be on the, we do look at generic generators, like if we say, if we can prove the efficiency of something like a gas turbine system by a few percent by printing um, turbines with integrated cooling channels that can sustain that operating environment, I mean, regardless of whether or not it's possible, you're still saving energy right now with your turbine, that is, um, very kind of official. I think that looking at the feedstocks question is a huge one. Uh, the recycled materials, and that you can envision uh, a scenario in which you take your used packaging, your, you know, your soda bottle, or whatever, and you have a home system that could potentially even recycle that in some way um, into some sort of reprinting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this guy. Um, the future is now, folks. <laughs> so I think that's obviously uh, reusing is, is much better than processing the original materials. Uh, pretty at wide open. I think one of the some of the more interesting, at least intellectually, is what designers don't know. They still um, everyone designs with what you, especially in a firm, 
that needs to produce things to make a living, they operate under the constraints of what they can make. And the mentality switch between, okay, well, no, I really do have free-form capability now, assuming we have been perfectly print these things, of course, but um, is not ingrained in almost anyone's uh, mind. And still, even though even those that are really ahead of the curve, still, I mean, still have to remind themselves, oh, I don't need to use straight lines here. I don't have to, I don't have to put bonding flanges here and there. I'll just make it one piece. Or like, take that challenge of, say, um, an assembly that does multiple different things. Um, but what does it really do if you strip away? If you take away all those pieces, forget about them, and say, what is the service that this thing provides? There's probably a simpler solution that doesn't include all those pieces, right? So re-envisioning that whole system and putting it together. You could save a lot of energy in those areas, and you could end up with an assembly, essentially, that used to be an assembly, and you could end up with something that's more um, just by virtue of all the reasons. So we're not there yet. Um, you know, and there are many possible examples. You know, high surface area components, things like heat exchangers, potentially do a lot of things like that. Mixing of gases at a small scale, catalysis uh, reactions. I mean, there's so many ways. It's potential. We're not, we're not there yet. No, we're not there. A lot of areas. Ali. Um, I suppose so. From from my perspective, I mean, I think everybody would agree with me that we need to stop to stop uh, the excessive use of our natural resources. Um, and going forward, there's two ways uh, I believe we can go about it. One is obviously the recycling route, and we have people like Philabot doing that. There's a company called Barlow for the Oceans that's trying to clean up the oceans of all the, the plastic that's floating around there, and they want to try and make plastic from that. Um, and then there's the, the other way as well, where we actually just take uh, the use of natural resources out of its natural environment and do it in, in alternative ways, either in a lab or, you know, in different sort of recreated artificial environments. Um, and I think the problem with the, the second option, the sort of environmental one, I mean the biological one right now, is just the scalability of it. So we've got the technology down, we know we can do it. The next big challenge is going to be to scale it up to something which is usable and actually has a, a, a measurable impact on the things um, of natural resources in farming, in soil manufacturing, and, and all those sort of processes that are currently polluting everything from land to ocean. Yes, yeah, so um, the, the three printers we work with, again, are of one type, the plastic, and I think recycling across every uh, type of 3D printing is, is really important because uh, with 3D printing you have that option to have very little wasted material because you're adding material to build the object. Um, instead of taking away, right? So that in like in metal 3D printing and bio is going to be very important. Um, the reason I picked uh, FDM, uh, this type of uh, 3D printing process, is because it's the most widely adopted. Um, it's the one that is the most common out there. And uh, being in Vermont, I just had this, this uh, recycling, um, this reusing attitude instilled in me. Um, and that's why I work with uh, the FDM types. But, it's definitely needed across every um, every 3D printing style and every every application. So I think if we if we look at the environment, if we look at nature and see how things are built there, um, we see that that it, it's all additive processes. Um, you know, you start from uh, DNA to RNA to eventually proteins, and, and that's how things get constructed. Very bottom up approach. Um, so I think. Sort of aligning ourselves with that is, is important, and, and I see uh, these additive manufacturing technologies as a possibility. Um, but I think again, we need um, software that helps us integrate all those things, we need machines and workflows that integrate all those things together. Um, and, but it, but it, it definitely, I mean, we can see that there are examples of it uh, already moving forward. Um, so I think. I think Awesome, thank you. Uh, so I'd like to open this up to questions. Uh, we got one right there. Yeah, I have a question. Well, I guess it's for everybody, but specifically for Blake. The, uh, my experience is that the software is the cranky part of the whole mess. And if, if like an organization like yours were to take on software as a major, you know, how do you, the, the visualization of everything, everybody prints things and then they, throw them away or whatever, and that's, you know, an environmental issue. But for me, it's more, I, I use soft, I mean, uh, SolidWorks, and I know that there's idiosyncrasies, Rhino and some of these other things, Libra, 
that they all have their own specialties. But you have to spend years and years to get down to that 3D. I mean, I've been doing 3D stuff since the 80s. And so, but I still struggle with a lot of the, the, the software. And you can't just jump from one to the next because it's all 5K to do it. Whereas if an organization like yours were to say, we're going to focus on this. And, you know, worrying about all the different software companies is not really your problem. If you could get it to where students, as you know, as young as you can get them, could get into, start developing, you know, working with the software, in my mind, that takes all sorts of electronic stuff out of the way, all the machinery, all the other stuff, and then you start making things that really make a difference if the software visualization can get you there. And without the super funding of like an organization like yours, you know, Autodesk is going to come in and give free software all over the place. But they have a vision of selling software to as soon as you get out of school. That you're you're hooked on their 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 thing. Whereas if uh, as a government entity, you could focus on things like making software ubiquitous, like the telephone. You know, like making it so that people could think. You know, quickly. For me, that would make a big difference. That's a very good point, and there are a lot of different facets to that. I think that um, uh, you're, you're, you know, I, I totally hear your comments, and I, I, I'll try to, try to address the various different pieces. Mm -hmm. we'll have an hour here. Right. Um, but I, I, the, the first is uh, the first thing I just saw right now is that the tailwinds are. Well, I said the tailwinds are. Software development. Yeah. I think that would be the golden standard that I think would help a lot. Um, and you do see things in the search in your business case. You do see things. I mean, Autodesk giving away their free software. That's what we tell them. Right. They're being pushed. The market is changing uh, to right. more democratize software solutions, and they, uh, in, in that sense, could be seen as an innovator. So I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't. I think those. The business case for software of the last decade is in my case, so I'll put a future of my personal perspective. So that's one thing that people might um, think about there. But otherwise, so I, got really, like, I think like, thinking about it in terms of software modularity is also a big help. And you already see some of the CAD CAM and things like that, where um, there's, you know, let other guys sell the generic platform. Let the seller sell the generic platform. Right. Uh, the right. Uh, right. Uh, right. Uh, whatever. Um, as, but, Make it be available to interface with other like, plugins, models, etc., right. so that you can you can even customize as needed. But your own interface, how you like it to display, it is up to you. Um, I give, I think that lets that, that give sort of a little bit of I think, I think we're heading in that direction. We personally will not fund technology or software solutions unless they interface with other with others. I mean, right. Certain companies will say, um, Company X, you know, will fund you. You will you, you make this one software, only you will sell it, and right. only you will profit. And you specifically, don't do that. Um, I try to make it the opposite. Um, and then lastly, the software doesn't end at the development side of things. Um, from there, you have know, your slicing software, you have your file formats between um, between your CAD CAM programs down to your it's now an STL file. STL, STL files aren't great, but they're not really well suited for the future. So there's a lot of work there, and there are a lot of different agencies working on it. There are others that are working on it, standards bodies are working on it, especially the American Linux community and those that are involved in the network. So I'm hoping that we'll have better file formats in terms of uh, slicing software. Yeah. See, I'm thinking more of the development. You know, so open source is wonderful, except when you need help. I mean, I can call up the seller right away and get and get walk through something. Like, how do I do some complicated thing? Whereas, what I'm thinking more is if the the power of the government to 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 actually do R and D themselves in this area. I think, in my mind, would take us to, to the next level because I, you know, it, that's where I see the kink in the whole thing. Like everybody's developing their own little thing, and then, but when you actually go to production, that's when the elect, that's when the, the electricity starts getting used. I think standards development is something like this program. Right. All right. Um, I want to grab a couple other questions up here. 
it's still a very new community. Um, and we have such a diverse amount of people, kind of people that are there in the shop. And so my question is, uh, how do we develop this culture of sustainability in the shop? How do we make makers sustainable? How do we teach them initially, like from the beginning, to think sustainably with, you know, when it comes to creating their products or creating, you know, whatever they dreamed of. Um, as the technology is still developing, and it's amazing what you guys are doing, um, on, on our end, how do we support that um, cost effectively, uh, but, you know, have people thinking the way that you're thinking? Yeah. Um so I think one of the big things is like 3D printing, you can really customize whatever you need um, and 3D print it and like, oh, it doesn't work, we'll start over and do it again, right? But we just received, uh, we received pallets of failed prints at our warehouse and we sort through them. And uh, we just got our biggest shipment of failed prints in, it was three pallets and just bags and bags of failed 3D printed parts. Um, now sure, that's less material than if you're gonna do it traditionally, but just like not, uh, not using that mentality of, oh, we can just print it again. I think you need to instill um, that, yes, we can print it again, but just do it right the first time, or try to do it right the first time. So we have all this software behind it that can uh, can help visualize and test the, the objects. I think, so, yeah. I think that you also have to cut yourself some slack in, in the hackerspace and education. like. You're researching, you're figuring stuff out. Like, it's gonna be inefficient. Um, and, but that's part of learning. Um, so I think uh, I would focus a, a little bit less on like the, the, the very particular efficiency of, of what it is that you're doing and focus more on uh, people actually understanding the larger systemic issues um, and being able to design for those things. Okay. Hey, uh, Tom Song from Source 3. Um, my question is kind of a little bit bigger, less the environmental impact. Um, our company, <clears throat> over the last year, has been working with brands and other companies to try to bring 3D products, 3D print products into marketplaces. So um, we just launched a 3D print album cover, a journey and sticks and stuff like this, and really kind of interesting stuff. Um, but, and, and I'm also formally with 3D systems, so I, I knew enough to be dangerous with a lot of these printers to kind of be able to talk to things. But, you know, one of the things we're running into now, in particular, because now people are looking at us and going, oh, okay, we we're really interested in this, become certain material issues. Material issues like CPSC, um, things like that, even um, like I don't think a company like Peacemaker are out there with these 3D printed uh, EM machines that they're saying are qualified and cleared for use. Really not, you don't know, like, think, you're like, okay, I'll take that at face value, but I don't know if that's right or not. Well, kind of, you know, talking like probably you make perfect time about foam, right? It's one day, all these pieces are going to come together. Who's, who's looking after or trying to work with, you know, industry today that says, that's great, but we've got set guidelines, and by the way, try to break them down if possible. We've found ways to sneak around, and even then now we're, we're past that. Point. We can't just sneak around. Right. So are there things that are being looked at for that, you know, who, or who's doing that, and, and who are they talking to, you know, so that down the road when these things become available more commercially. You know, we know that all the all the things involved is so that they can work together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah so uh, we were mentioning 3D printed electronics and um, when you have like a circuit uh, with electricity flowing through it, uh, you really need to have it like certified as a, a UL or a, a BR fire rating. Because um, it can't overheat and burn. So I mean, our application, uh, we use plastic as a binder. So it, even if you have like hard carbon to get that conductive property, um, that might not get qualified to be print. So there's like uh, there's a lot of certification that needs to happen. So you know to understand the process and how it all works together um, to make sure that the techniques that are being developed can be used in the future. So um, uh, I'm at the School of Education at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University, and I work with a lot of educators. And one of the questions I'm getting a lot um, beyond kind of print food uh, is <laughs> the, the uh, there's not a whole lot of studies that I've found out that they're actually measuring parking land or otherwise related to print in an enclosed environment. Um, with ABS especially, you've got those not
have the fumes going off and the parents are freaking out about it. So, you know, what kind of research and what is being done to really evaluate the safety of using the materials currently we're using and the current and the materials we're thinking about using? Because in these educational environments, that's a big concern. Um, um, I don't have a comprehensive uh, understanding of all the work that's been done, but there was work in 2014, I think, that um, was funded by, uh, I think it was funded by the National Science Foundation. It was a study on PLA versus ABS, yes. and um, it was, they did find styrene uh, levels to be quite high with ABS, and particular battery concentrations to be high. Um, there is a more current, uh, it's not out yet, but there's currently, I think the Journal of Industrial Ecology is, is publishing a special issue on environmental issues related to hunting, and I think it's very wide net, so it may, um, it may be fielding uh, questions like that. So just keep your eyes out for Which that. that you said? I think it's the Journal of Industrial Ecology. Uh, it's not out yet, but I think I think a quick note on that. So like, when you have a laser cutter in a maker space, you have to have a density, right? So maybe when you're 3D printing with ABS, you have a density, you have like a carbon HEPA filter um, that's you know closed in the box. and. Uh, that's something we've looked into and something people have asked us because our machines are actually heating a larger volume of plastic. So it's a very real concern for us. Um, it's something we're not turning our eye to. Um, we're, we're actually you know, working to, to solve solutions to that point. Um, all right, we'll take one more question. Yes. This is kind of a down-to-earth question. Um, I'm actually more of a layman in this world. I'm, I'm a lawyer and I do a lot of energy and uh, logistics and infrastructure work. But I was curious as to whether the Department of Energy can or has been thinking about the R&D side of um, 3D solar panels that can be used by the average person so they can start turning their own solar panels rather than because apparently it's still fairly expensive to do it if you have to go to an outside entity. And I just wanted to put a example. Um, uh, as quickly, there has been some work on packaging, like on um, deployable units, or things like if you're a field kit or something like that on the packaging side. Solar panels themselves have some very complicated chemistry, and they're not able to get there yet. Uh, you know, for certain projects, the products that just will never be cost effective as we print them if they work on a battery or a process and there's a certain volume like that. So I think there has been, I you know, some work in the right way, but I don't think if we print it for solar probably the near future on stuff that will look That's a good question. So I don't know about all of you, but I could sure use a 3D printed fan right now. It's really hot. <laughs> um, I want to thank my panelists. Um, you know, this was a fantastic panel. We learned a lot of really interesting